You know, when in 2000 the genome was decoded, it was discovered that only 2% of the genome actually codes for proteins, and as you know, the other 98% was dismissed as junk, junk DNA. Um, last week, six days ago, the result of 1,600 experiments by 450 scientists in 32 different institutions discovered that actually that 98% that people thought was junk isn't junk at all. It's absolutely essential for the maintenance of life. I'm not quite sure um, what the chief rabbi's motive was in bringing up this fascinating new DNA work. I mean, I do think it is, it is fascinating. I have noticed that there are some creationists who are jumping on it because they think that's awkward for Darwinism. Um, quite the contrary, of course. It's exactly what a Darwinist would hope for, is to find, is to find usefulness in, uh, in, in, the, in the living world. A neutral mutation is one that, although easily measurable by molecular genetic techniques, is not subject to natural selection, either positive or negative. Pseudogenes are neutral for one kind of reason. They are genes that once did something useful, but have now been sidelined and are never transcribed or translated. They might as well not exist as far as the animal's welfare is concerned. But as far as the scientist is concerned, they very much exist, and they are exactly what we need for an evolutionary clock. Pseudogenes are only one class of those genes that are never translated in embryology. There are other classes which are preferred by scientists for molecular clocks, but I won't go into detail. What pseudogenes are useful for is embarrassing creationists. It stretches even their creative ingenuity to make up a convincing reason why an intelligent designer should have created a pseudogene, a gene that does absolutely nothing and gives every appearance of being a superannuated version of a gene that used to do something, unless he was deliberately setting out to fool us. Leaving pseudogenes aside, it is a remarkable fact that the greater part 95% in the case of humans, of the genome might as well not be there for all the difference it makes. I have noticed that there are some creationists who are jumping on it because they think that's awkward for Darwinism. Um, quite the contrary, of course. It's exactly what a Darwinist would hope for, is to find, is to find usefulness in, uh, in, in, the, in the living world. The only alternative to it being a family tree is that the intelligent designer deliberately set out to deceive us in the most underhand and devious manner. Um, <laughs> more, moreover, the same thing works with, with every gene you do separately, and even pseudogenes that don't do anything but are vestigial relics of genes that once, that once did something. I find it extremely hard to imagine how any creationist who actually bothered to listen to that could possibly doubt the fact of evolution, but they don't listen. I have noticed that there are some creationists who are jumping on it because they think that's awkward for Darwinism. For instance, it appears that the amount of DNA in organisms is more than is strictly necessary for building them. A large fraction of the DNA is never translated into protein. From the point of view of the individual organism, this seems paradoxical. If the purpose of DNA is to supervise the building of bodies, it is surprising to find a large quantity of DNA which does no such thing. Biologists are racking their brains trying to think what useful task this apparently surplus DNA is doing. But from the point of view of the selfish genes themselves, there is no paradox. The true purpose of DNA is to survive no more and no less. The simplest way to explain the surplus DNA is to suppose that it is a parasite, or at best a harmless but useless passenger, hitching a ride in the survival machines created by the other DNA. It's exactly what a Darwinist would hope for, is to find, is to find usefulness in, uh, in, in, the, in the living world.
Genomes are littered with nonfunctional pseudogenes, faulty duplicates of functional genes that do nothing, while their functional cousins, the word doesn't even need scare quotes, get on with their business in a different part of the same genome. And there's lots more DNA that doesn't even deserve the name pseudogene. It too is derived by duplication, but not duplication of functional genes. It consists of multiple copies of junk, tandem repeats, and other nonsense which may be useful for forensic detectives but which doesn't seem to be used in the body itself. Once again, creationists might spend some earnest time speculating on why the creator should bother to litter genomes with untranslated pseudogenes and junk tandem repeat DNA. Can we measure the information capacity of that portion of the genome which is actually used? We can at least estimate it. In the case of the human genome it is about 2%, considerably less than the proportion of my hard disk that I have used since I bought it. I have noticed that there are some creationists who are jumping on it because they think that's awkward for Darwinism. Um, quite the contrary, of course, it's exactly what a Darwinist would hope for, is to find, is to find usefulness in, uh, in, in, the, in the living world.